Morel. 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 No guests today, no? Yes, we have a little more actually. She's <laughs> been with us all weekend, so. Uh, we've got our speaker today is Kevin. He's from Stanway. He'll be delivering our word today. So, give him a nice warm welcome, mate, to you, please. And now I hand over to Peter for the notices. Yes, morning, T. Wall. As you see, it's Kevin who lead the service, and communion will be part of the service. Then this evening, 6 pm, we're expecting a visit from Paul Marsh. I understand he is in the area, so he's speaking at the South End D band this morning. Tuesday, prayer and Bible study, 7 pm at the church. And Wednesday, 6 pm, boys' club. Then next Sunday, the 10th of September, in the morning, 10.30, Carl Page. Make here refreshments after the service. There'll be jam for the children, and in the evening, 6 pm, will be myself. Streets for prayer, Moreland's, Moreland's clothes, Morin's clothes, New England Crescent. The UEC Church, to remember in prayer this week, is the one in Camberwell. And our missionary focus is MAF. I would say pick up one of your uh, le uh, prayer letters, but uh, they've got to be printed because our friends are running out of back in. So uh, hopefully by the end of the service you'll find some more at the back there. One other notice, it's come round where the churches have to send in their, their entry for the next prayer focus. Does anybody else, anybody want to volunteer to do it for this uh, half year? If not, a lot will fall on Joey, won't it? But, uh, well, I'll give you an opportunity, but uh, have a word with me afterwards if you uh, uh, feel that, feel uh, that you want to do it, have a change of reporter from the church. If not, I'll try and remember and uh, put something in there. Let's just give a thanks for the offerings. Heavenly Father, you are a good God. You have been you're so good for us in our lives. And Lord, as offerings have been presented and given in the offering boxes for the church work, and the missionary work. Lord bless it, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. It's good to be here. Uh, it's quite a since I was last here. I might have even been pre COVID. But, uh, that, that seems a long time ago, doesn't it? Well, it seems like we've forgotten two years. Ooh. Yeah. Nothing, nothing about COVID. Yeah, look, look, this, this, uh, this stand together and worship, we're going to sing. Come, let us join. So it's number 93. I guess I'm going to do that.
just want to thank you for your goodness to us. And uh, I want to thank you, Lord, for the fact that we're here this morning in your house and, and with your people. And then, Father, as we just meet together, we really want to just give you freedom this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would just come and move upon us and, and speak to each one of us, so from the youngest to the oldest. But as we leave this place today, Lord, we will know that we've not just met with friends and family, but we've met with you, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I just ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, which you will find on page 1173. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for reading that. As you said, again, this is, this is God's word. It's not just a, a book that someone has written. It's the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, um, it's God's word to us. We're going to just have a time of prayer. So let's just come before that throne of grace. Father God, we, we just want to thank you for, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we, we live in a land where we can freely read your word. Um, where we're conscious that there are brothers and sisters around the world today who, who don't have that freedom, Lord, who, who perhaps don't even own a Bible. They, they, they meet perhaps if they can in secret and in fear today. Father, we pray for them. We pray for the church that is persecuted. Uh, Father, I just want to pray for, for the church here, the uh, Great Wakering, the, the church at Stanway, the, the church in, in our country, Father, as, as we have this freedom, and, and yet we, we, we're probably not so as, um, 
as faithful and as a church, the church, not any particular church, as, as, as Christians, as some of the, our brothers and sisters who are persecuted. The church seems to be growing in these places, and yet we, we, we look here and, and perhaps we see that uh, the church is not growing as much as we like it. We are we're so blessed with material things, Lord, we, and we thank you for that, but there seems to be in our society a, a sense that we, we have what we need, but why do we need God? We are comfortable. We are our own people. We look after number one, but we have everything that we want. And, and, and that's generally what, what a lot of people will, will think over here, Lord, and particularly in the West. Why do they need God when they have what they need? You know, we can flick a switch and the light comes on. We can turn a tap and we have water. And, and, and by doing that, we, we are so blessed more than many millions of people in this world. Father, we are a, a church that has gone back in, your, in, in this country and other countries in the West. We, we've approved of, of things that you don't approve of. We've gone back on you. We, we struggle, I think, to, to call ourselves a Christian nation today. Father, I pray for our church in this country, but for here at, at Stanley and other UEC churches, Lord, that in these, in these times that seem dark, in these times that where it seems that, that nothing good is happening, Lord, that you would just raise up believers in this land. Lord, you'll raise us up as, as uh, ambassadors, as disciples of yours, Lord, to, to proclaim the gospel um, and to share Jesus in, in our daily lives with the people that we come across. Whatever we're doing, Father, I pray that you will give us opportunities to, to share a word, to come alongside people and, and to, to perhaps to show them love practically and, and that the reason that we're doing that is because we love Jesus. For well, our desire as, as, as churches, of, of, of any church, Lord, should be that, that, that the lost come and hear the gospel and, and be saved. It's, you know, it's, it's great that we meet together, and that is a purpose of church, Lord, that we meet together to, to study, to, to learn, to, to build ourselves up. But ultimately, that, that we may go out and that we may share the gospel with others. So, Father, just pray for the experiences that each one of us will have during this week as we meet people uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And, Lord, would you just, as I say, create these opportunities? It's not always easy to speak out and, and, to, and to say something, Lord, but I pray that... Uh, You'll make it so clear to us when we have to do that. Uh, the opportunity is there. Say something. And uh, you know, Lord, we're, we're just sowing seeds by what we do and, and by how we live. That, that should be the way that, that it works for believers. But, but for, so often, Lord, we, we find ourselves, um, as I said, with the children, going out of the garden, doing things that, that perhaps we shouldn't be doing. We, we fall into temptation. We sin. We mess things up. And, and, and all of us do that, Father. And, and we perhaps look back and, and just wish that we hadn't have done that or said that, or we should have said something and we didn't. Father, I just pray that you'll just take uh, the guilt away and just encourage us to move forward. We can't change what's in the past, but we can move forward in the future. Uh, and I love that everything that you, you allow to happen to us just uh, shapes us into the people that you want us to be. And so, Father, I pray that. Uh, that this church here, you would give opportunity for them to share their love of Christ in, in whatever they do in, in, in their weekly program and with the, the neighbours around them. You know, as I drive in, I see so many new buildings, by the way, so many new homes going up in the area. And I'm sure the church here are praying for those there. And I just want to add to those prayers, Father, that the people who, who move in, Lord, that you would draw to you, draw to yourself. Uh, it's the same in, in Stanway, the, the amount of buildings that have gone up in recent years is, is astronomical. Um, it's just so many. And uh, just pray for these, uh, these um, folk that move into the area. Some of them are believers already and uh, some are not, obviously. But Lord, we just want to pray that we will be effective in sharing the gospel. We'll be effective in sowing seed. Um, Lord, your word tells us that you know, sometimes we will sow and others will reap. And it's not always the case that we, we speak to people and they become Christians straight away. Lord, we're sowing the seed into their lives. Um, so I just thank you for that, Lord, that we have the opportunity to sow seed into people's lives. At the moment in this land, we have the freedom to still do it. And I uh, thank you for that, Lord. But uh, just pray for those who don't and yet still do. And uh, what an example they are to us, Lord. 
So Father, as we uh, continue in worship here, as we continue to, to sing shortly and look into your word, Father, I pray that, that you would bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit, just to speak to each one of us. Uh, your word is seed. And uh, you told the parable, Jesus, of the, the seed that fell on good soil and the seed that fell by the wayside. And Father, I pray today that the, the seed of your word will fall on good soil on our hearts. It will grow and it will produce a harvest, Father. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to sing uh, How Sweet the Name uh, before we look into God's Word. We'll sing that and then we'll look into that uh, passage in the book of Ephesians. Dig a little bit deeper and see what God is saying to us. Monday or Tuesday, it's a bit of a chill in the air in the morning. Did you notice it here? Definitely about Colchester, it was uh, been quite a warm up to it, but I went out Monday morning and thought, this is a bit chilly, a bit of a nip in the air. We, you know, summer's sort of gone, isn't it? And uh, I think we can have a, a bit of a resurgence at the end of this week with temperatures back up in uh, like 25, 26 again. But I'm going to share. Well, you can see that. It's after children's sledging. Obviously, it gets a bit cold. We get some snow. Uh, some years, some years we don't. But, uh, I quite like it if we get some snow. I know a lot of people don't. But uh, this is um, a couple of children, brother and sister. And they, they were sledging under a bridge. This is uh, 29th of December 2012. So there's a 13-year-old boy and his 10-year-old sister. And they're sledging under this bridge by a railway. Uh, and they make a shocking discovery. They, they come across the half-frozen body of a homeless man who'd wearing only a light jacket. And uh, this is not the UK, this is somewhere in America, Wyoming, I think. The temperatures were down about minus 12 that night. And he only had a light jacket and uh, he froze to death. 60-year-old Timothy Henry Gray 
tragic, isn't it, uh, when any homeless person would, would, would freeze to death. But this case was particularly tragic because he was a long lost relative of a, a reclusive, eccentric New York millionaire, and uh, who died the previous year. They'd been looking for him because he'd inherited $34.5 million from her $300 million, million estate, and he didn't know it. He was rich, if you like, beyond measure, but he was living as a pauper because he didn't know the inheritance that he had. And, and the book of Ephesians is a bit like that. Paul is writing to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure with who they are and what they have in Christ, yet they're living as paupers because like Thomas Henry Gray, they are ignorant of the wealth that they have. So if you take the book of Ephesians, it's only six chapters, the first three chapters, Paul is, is beginning by laying down some doctrine of the riches that we have in Christ. He's describing, if you like, their, their inheritance. And I've got some uh, verses to put on the board. Peter also describes it, where he says that, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled and that does not fade away and it's reserved in heaven for you and for me who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation to be revealed in the last time. They had a heavenly inheritance. They were rich beyond measure, far richer than Thomas's $34.5 million because they were rich spiritually. And it's about who they were and what they had in Christ. And if you read through the epistles, I often say this at, at our church, the, you go through the epistles, and if you look at every time Paul says, in him, through him, in Christ, by Christ, and God, something like that, you underline that. That, that is a, an inheritance that we have. That is one of the promises that we have from God through the Holy Scriptures of who we are in Christ. And if you read through you will find, just in this first little part that was read to us, that uh, they're told they've been accepted in Christ, they've been redeemed, they've been forgiven, they had the seal of the Holy Spirit, they were guaranteed eternal life, they were once far off, they've been brought near by the blood of Christ, and through him they had access to the Spirit by one Father. They were also no longer strangers and foreigners, they were fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, they had all these things, and they were ignorant of it. And friends, I, I guess so we are. So can we be. And Paul prayed in that passage that was read to us that their eyes would be opened. And if you've got your Bibles, I haven't got a slide for this one, but between uh, verse 17 and 23 of, of chapter 1, Paul prays this prayer, fantastic prayer, but the, the heart of it is that their eyes would be opened that they will know. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding, not, not physical sight, is the eyes of their understanding may be enlightened, that they may know what is the hope of his calling and what are, what is their inheritance, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us and he goes on to say that the power that he's talking about is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And Paul is praying here, uh, as he writes to them, he's praying for them that their spiritual eyes would be enlightened, that they would know the glory of the things that they have in Christ. They would know the exceeding power that is in them, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And you know, we often, we know that when we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes in, don't we, and indwells us. We know that. But how often do we think that that same power that raised Christ from the dead is in us? We can be ignorant of it. In short, Paul is saying that they had every spiritual blessing in Christ. As verse 3 says, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. That's what Paul's laying down in his first few chapters. And because of that, in, uh, in chapter 3, you may want to turn there, he, he, he prays another prayer. So this is the first three chapters, he's laying down 
who they are in Christ, what they have in Christ, and he's laid it all out, and he says in verse 14, for this reason, because of everything I've told you, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he goes on in verse 16, that he would grant you, according to his riches, to the riches in glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in their hearts, in our hearts. That we should be rooted and grounded in love. And that we can comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ. And he finishes with it in verse 20. I love this verse. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That same power that is in us, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, through that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever imagine. That's what Paul is saying to these Ephesian believers. And you know, if you, if I could spend weeks just going through the first three chapters of Ephesians, of the doctrine that Paul is laying down as who we are and what we have in Christ. Uh, I'm not going to do that obviously this morning, I'm just doing a bit of a, a broad spectrum, focusing in on, on a couple of things. It's, he's laying down doctrine, and we can read that, but you know, doctrine is one thing, our walk is another. You know, we can know all that the Bible says. We can read it, we can memorize it, we can learn it, we can know about it, but do we live it? Do we live it? Paul says in chapter 4, As a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That's the same with us, isn't it, friends? We should walk worthy to the calling with which we've been called. Because what we know and how we live out are two different things. People can't see what you know, but people can see how you walk. Jesus, you know, when he warned about false prophets and false teachers, he said you will know them by their fruit. You will know them by the, the things that their life brings out, the things that their life portrays. False prophets, false teachers will be known by bad fruit. In the same way, you know, the world will know the truth because of the good fruit in the lives of believers, of how we walk day to day. What we know is one thing, how we walk is another. How are we walking? How are you walking? How am I walking? What is the calling of my life? What is the calling of your life? You must say, I don't have a calling. I believe every believer has a calling. Are we walking worthy of our calling? Are we walking worthy of the God who saved us. So we move on to verse 17 in chapter 4. Paul says, that, Therefore I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all their uncleanness, with greediness. Don't walk, he says, as the world walks. He actually says, therefore, I, I say therefore and testify in the Lord. Paul says basically, I'm speaking on behalf of God. Let me tell you this, you need to stop living as the rest of the world lives. Stop it. Don't do it anymore. You are changed people. You should live differently. I spoke about COVID earlier on, didn't I? And how those I don't know, when you look back in time, those two years seem to have just vanished. But it, it was a difficult time, wasn't it? But, but one, one thing I, I look at, it, it seemed to change our perspective on what we think about positive and negative. Because yeah? normally positive is a good thing, isn't it? If we test positive for COVID, it's a bad thing. Negatives can be good. There's a lot of what I call positive teaching in the church today. I don't know if you watch any of the Christian television or things or stuff on YouTube. But if you listen to some preachers, you, you, you're going to think that God's main objective with, with people today is, is to make poor people wealthy. Yeah? To make sad people happy. To make insecure people confident. 
so we can live our best life now. We can live to our full potential. They don't want to preach negative things. They don't want to preach about sin and hell, judgment and condemnation. You know, people won't come to the church if they do that. They want big churches. And their leaders live in these multi-million dollar mansions. Well, all around them in their cities are people with great need. But if you consider God's commands to us, his primary commands to us are in the negative. Yeah, he said in the, in the Garden of Eden, you shall not eat of the fruit of that tree, because the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Think of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. In fact, eight of them are in the negative. You shall not take any other gods before me, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not lust after your neighbour's wife, you shall not covet. They're all in the negative. The only two that are positive are, you shall keep the Sabbath day holy, and you shall honour your father and mother. Paul says to this group, you need to stop living like you were non-believers again. You need to stop living like the world lives. Because the, the world is walking, and the, the King James Version says, in the vanity of their minds, or the futility of their minds. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can use some tools. And that word futility, or, or vanity, is the Greek word, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, mateotis, but it means what is devoid of truth and appropriateness? It means perverseness and depravity. The world walks in what is devoid of truth. And it walks in inappropriateness, and it walks in perverseness, and it walks in depravity. Why? Because their hearts are closed to God, they've been blinded, they've shut their minds to God, they're a million miles away from God. They're past feeling, they're past caring. The world just doesn't seem to care anymore, does it? We can do what we want. We can be what we want to be, who we want to be. There's, there seems to be, in, in many people's behaviour now, no distinction between right and wrong. Reminds me of the, the last verse of the book of Judges where it said that there was no king in Israel in those days and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If I want to do it, I'll do it. Doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, doesn't matter how it's going to affect anyone else, it's my right to do or to be what I want to be. No distinction between right and wrong. And that's the world we're living in, isn't it, today? It seems like the world has gone crazy. Some people talk about being progressive. The church needs to be progressive. The church needs to catch up with the world and change its ways. No. The church doesn't need to change its ways. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter it says, knowing this, first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. That's what we see today, isn't it? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through to 5, Paul says, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That's the world today, isn't it? And Paul goes on, and from such people, turn away. Turn away. I don't believe he's saying, don't share the gospel with them. I don't believe he's saying, you know, don't talk to them at all and don't share the love of Christ. But he's saying, don't be like them, don't go with them, don't compromise. Don't accept what they're saying. Don't affirm what they believe. Because we need to be worthy of the calling. We need to walk worthy of the calling for which we have. In, in the book of Thessalonians, um, 
It said that they received a letter, supposedly from the Apostle Paul, pretending to be from the Apostle Paul, claiming that, that Jesus had already come and, and, and they'd missed out. I don't know what your, your end time theology is, I won't get into that today, but there's a verse there that, that many would use to support what we call the rapture. It says, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And they take that falling away to mean a catching up of people. But I don't believe that's true in this case, because the Greek word for falling away is apostasia. Apostasy. Apostasy. There will be an apostasy. Let no one deceive you, Paul is saying, or to the Thessalonians, Jesus is not going to come again until there is an apostasy. Until people fall away from the faith. Apostasy means falling away. Apostasy means withdrawing or abandonment of the truth of God's word. And we see that all around us today, don't we? In, in, in different uh, parts of what we call the church. People will twist scripture, pervert scripture to suit their own agenda. They'll live a life that is at, at odds with what God says. They're often marked by pride and, and flattery. They'll cause division. And they're more focused on the things of the world than they are the things above. And this is Paul talking about the church. Not the world, it's talking about the church here. Christians, pride, flattery, causes of division. Focused on this world, not on things of art. And Paul is saying to this church in Ephesus, who are so spiritually rich, but they didn't really know it, he says, stop living like that. Don't live like the world lives. You've come out of that. It says in verse 20 of chapter 4, you haven't learned, but you've not learned, so learn Christ. If indeed you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. He says to them, that's not how you have been taught. That's not how I taught you. That's not how you were taught by God. And he goes on in, in verse 30 and 31, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. They knew the Holy Spirit. They had been born again, they had been filled with the Spirit. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Their salvation was guaranteed, but they're not living how they should be living. And Paul says, when you do this, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're grieving the one who, who is in you. Friends, when we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for grieve means to cause or to feel sorrow, to feel pain, to feel unhappiness or, to, or distress. So when these Ephesian believers were sinning, when we sin, and let's be honest, we do, don't we? We're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're causing Him sorrow. We're causing Him pain, unhappiness, distress. Paul, talking to the Corinthians in, in, in chapter 3, verse 17, he said, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Another translation I found said that where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. Slight difference, but I like that other translation. Where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. You know, we, as believers, we get tempted, don't we? The devil comes and he tempts us. And, and sometimes we give in, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do it without even thinking. But sometimes we sin because we, we have thought about it and we still want to do it anyway. You know, if I'm, if I'm at work and I, I bash my finger with a hammer, the first thing that comes to my mind is perhaps not a nice word. That's unintentional. I, I haven't planned on getting up that morning and saying that or thinking that. 
But some people are so um, enslaved by the enemy that they, they, they know what they want to do and they go out and do it. Paul says here, where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. When we make the Holy Spirit, when we make Jesus, when we make God the true Lord of our life, there is liberty from the bondage that we can find if we continue in sin. But the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he, He'll never be Lord of our lives while we're still grieving Him deliberately. I mean, while we still continue in intentional sin. And as Paul said, it, it, it comes down to this battle between the old man and the new man. Between the, the flesh and the spirit. Now we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit, we have this new man, and yet there's this old man still there, isn't there? It's a battle. We have to fight, don't we? We have to deliberately try to, to deny our, our flesh and live in the Spirit. I want you to notice what Paul says about that in Galatians 5.16. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Notice the way that he says that. He doesn't say, try not to walk in the lust of the flesh, and then you'll walk in the spirit. But that's so often the way that we try and do it. I mean, we try to live a good life. We try not to sin. We try to do it ourselves. But Paul is saying, no, walk in the spirit first, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do we walk in the spirit? Three things, really, I think. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in his word. And we need to be obedient. We need to be in prayer, don't we? And we know how important prayer is, and yet we find it difficult sometimes, don't we? To find time to pray, to, to know what to pray. We can't walk in the Spirit unless we're praying. We are people of prayer. There has to be a place in our life where we get into God's presence. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in His Word. You know, He's given His Word so I said to the children, everything in there is, is for us, for our instruction to teach us as examples. We need to obey his word as well. It's no good just reading the word and knowing the word. It's about how we walk. It's about being obedient to the word. If we are in prayer and if we are in the word and we're not obedient, and being in prayer and being in the Word is just nice things to do. We can be deceived. We need to obey. James, he said, do not be doers of the Word and not hearers only, because if you do, you're deceiving yourselves. Paul continues in Ephesians in chapter 5 now, verse 15, see that you walk circumspectly. Walk diligently. Walk perfectly. Don't be drunk with wine. He says, be fully filled with the Spirit. And then finally, in chapter 6, a oh, very well-known passage of Scripture, I, I love this part, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, and you may stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. How do we get the honour of God? In prayer, in the word, and in being obedient. In chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, Paul is laying down doctrine, telling the Ephesians, telling us that we are rich beyond measure, but we are ignorant of it. Chapters 4 to 6, Paul says, because of all this, you need to walk worthy of your calling. You need to stop living the way the world lives. We need to be different. We're set apart. And it's hard today, isn't it? When, when the world is, there's so much out there to offer people. But if we, if we give in, if, if we go the way of the world, then we're grieving the Holy Spirit. 
who, who is in us. But if we walk in the Holy Spirit, and, and, and if we pray, read the Word, and obey, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We can resist. He does not say that no temptation has come upon man that he, he cannot resist. We have to be walking in the Spirit to do that. Read through the book of Ephesians. Read through the other epistles. As I said, underline every time you hear in Him, in Christ, through Him. There's a promise there of something that we have in, in Him through our salvation. Something that we can claim. Something that we can hold dear to. Something that God has given us as an inheritance. He wants us, in the days that we have, to walk worthy, to, to share the gospel with others, to, to live a life that shows that we're different. And sometimes it's difficult to, to witness verbally. But I've, uh, I've had occasions where I used to work in a factory, a guy come up to me and said, Kevin, don't swear, why not? And you can start a conversation. I'm not saying that because I'm better than anyone else, I'm not. I sin as much as anyone else, so I mess up and get things wrong. But the way that we live our lives is important, isn't it? Because the world sees it. I trust that we can take hold of this in our hearts today and look at what we're doing. Are, are we living, are we doing some of the things that the world does? Are we doing some of the things that we were perhaps doing before we were saved? And we need to stop. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in the Word. We need to obey what God is telling us. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing a hymn as we prepare to, to meet around the communion table. Um, his hands were pierced. to go out to walk worthy for that which you've called us. In Jesus' name. Amen.